Today, I wanna break down the total sentences of tyroxycarcin D. This molecule belongs to the tyroxycarcin family but shows interesting biological activity. Before synthesizing a target, we should understand what we are about to encounter. So let's analyze the structural details of the tyroxycarcin D. This molecule is characterized by a modified anthraquinone backbone. It's stabilized by intramolecular hydrogen bonding between this enol and the carbonyl group. There is also a dioxabicyclo 221 heptane core, but it's hard to see from the front view perspective. If you look at this molecule from the opposite direction, you can see the bicyclic bridge skeleton. Interestingly, a spiroepoxide moiety is attached to the ring and it's essential for the bioactivity of this compound. There are also two modified hexose sugars. One of them is directly attached to the anthraquinone core and another is attached to the six-membered ring with the both conformation. Notice that both glycosidic bonds are in the axial position of the carbohydrates. Tyroxycarcins are divided into type 1 and type 2. In type 1, there is a spiroepoxide ring, but type 2 contains a diol group. Type 1 shows high antitumor activity, unlike type 2. So the presence of the epoxide ring is important for biological activity. But what is the relationship between the epoxide and biological activity? To understand this, in an experiment, a double-stranded DNA was incubated with type 1 tyroxycarcin to afford a DNA drug complex. As you can see, after incubation, tyroxycarcin intercalates into the DNA strand and creates a covalent bond with the guanine base. To clarify what exactly happened, let's zoom in on this area of DNA and explore the chemical bonds. Here is the anthraquinone core and the two sugar moieties of tyroxycarcin. Above it, you can see the guanine base attached to the tyroxycarcin through this covalent bond. The chemistry that's going on here is the nucleophilic addition of the nitrogen atom of the guanine base to the electrophile epoxide ring, forming a new carbon-nitrogen bond. After ring opening, the oxygen atom forms an intramolecular hydrogen bond with the axial hydroxyl group of the sugar moiety. In addition, there is another hydrogen bond between this nitrogen atom of guanine and the second sugar moiety of tyroxycarcin. On the other side of the structure, there is a primidine moiety of the cytosine base, making free hydrogen bonds with guanine. As a result of tyroxycarcin binding to DNA, the DNA structure is interrupted. The A and T bases lose contact with their complementary bases and flip out of the double strand. Now you can understand the role of the epoxide ring in type 1 tyroxycarcins. Because of electrophilicity, it acts as a DNA alkylating warhead. But type 2 tyroxycarcins lack the epoxide moiety, which explains the low bioactivity of this family. Since 2015, Nicolau and co workers have studied the synthetic approaches and biological properties of tyroxycarcin natural products, and they have accomplished a total synthesis of five members of this family. All of them share the same main skeleton, but they differ in the structure of their sugars. DC45A2 is the simplest member of this family, without any sugar moiety. In DC45A1, there is only one sugar. Tyroxycarcin A, D, and C contain two sugar moieties, but they differ in substituents on the sugars. Here I'm gonna walk you through the total synthesis of tyroxycarcin D. So let's analyze the retrosynthetic pathway. The first challenge is installing the two sugar moieties. This is addressed by using glycosyl o alkenyl benzoate as a glycosyl donor, and the AU complex as a promoter for the glycosylation reaction. Now focus on this hemiketal bound. It can be produced by attack of the alcohol on the carbonyl group to construct the six-membered ring. Further simplification leads to the allylic protected alcohol from which the epoxide ring can be installed by oxidation of a double bond. The challenging dioxabicyclo 221 heptane core could be assembled by a Lewis acid in the use epoxy ketone rearrangement. Cutting this bond results in two intermediates remaining from the Bailey's Hillman reaction, which leaves us with an exo double bond. The modified antraquinone derivative could be prepared from a series of CH functionalizations at three positions. Finally, the linear diffuse tricyclic skeleton is constructed by the Hauser cross annihilation reaction between cyanophetylite and 2 cyclohexanone. Now let's go through the forward synthesis. The synthesis of antraquinone skeleton starts with 4 methyl salicylic acid. What we're gonna do here is convert the carboxylic acid to an amide. To do this, we first need to activate the carboxylic acid for nucleophilic addition. One common strategy is converting the carboxylic acid to an acyl chloride. But here we can't directly use compounds like phosgene or phenyl chloride because these reagents are highly reactive and cause unwanted reactions on the phenol or aromatic ring. Instead, the Wilsmeyer reagent is created in situ under the reaction conditions. 
This strategy gives us more control over the reaction. Let me explain. The non-bonding electrons on the nitrogen atom in DMF trigger the attack of oxygen on oxalyl chloride, kicking off the chloride anion. Next, that chloride ion attacks the immunium ion, releasing carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, and generating the Wilsmeer reagent, which contains an electrophilic carbon atom. Next, dimethylamine and triethylamine are added to the mixture. Triethylamine acts as a base. Notice that dimethylamine is not added as a free amine. It's masked by acid because the free base is hard to handle. So triethylamine deprotonates it and generates free dimethylamine. In addition, triethylamine deprotonates the carboxylic acid. As a result, the nucleophilic carboxylate attacks the electrophilic Wilsmeer reagent, kicking off a chloride anion. That chloride then attacks the carbonyl group and regenerates DMF through an addition elimination mechanism, leaving us with the acyl chloride. Now dimethylamine attacks the acyl chloride to produce the desired amide. This strategy is effective because it's carried out near room temperature. Next, the remaining hydroxyl group is protected by MOM. After protection, formaldehyde is installed at the ortho position of the amide. Treatment with n beauty lithium results in ortho lithiation. Notice that the methyl group para to the amide group is also capable of lithiation. But since the reaction is carried out at minus 78 degrees, ortho lithiation is preferred at such a low temperature. Actually, this reaction is under kinetic control. At the ortho position, the lithium can coordinate to the oxygen of the carbonyl group. Due to this collation effect, the ortho lithiation pathway has a lower energy barrier compared to lithiation at the methyl group, which nicely explains the ortho selectivity. After adding DMF, it reacts with the lithiated intermediate. You might think that the amide bond is very stable. But the lithiated intermediate is strong enough to attack the carbonyl group of DMF, which leads to the formation of the aldehyde group. After that, the cyanide ion attacks the aldehyde, and the oxygen atom of the aldehyde attacks the amide bond, kicking off the dimethylamine and forming the cyanophetylide. The tricyclic ring is then produced by the hazard cross annulation. To do this, the cyanophetylide reacts with cyclohexanone. This reaction has a beautiful mechanism, so grab a piece of paper and try to rationalize how the tricyclic product is formed. This proton is acidic because of the electron withdrawing cyano group, which stabilizes the negative charge. Then it attacks the four position of the cyclohexanol, which is a Michael acceptor. The resulting enolate attacks the carbonyl group to create an unstable bridge structure. After that, the negative charge moves back to the carbon atom, leading to the rupture of the carbon-oxygen bond and formation of another carbonyl group, another side of the molecule. At the same time, the cyano group leaves the molecule. After cleaning up the structure, the tricyclic skeleton is formed. Then it undergoes tautomerization, and the carbonyl groups are converted to hydroxyl groups to extend the length of conjugation. Without isolating the crude product, it undergoes monomethylation using dimethyl sulfate as a methyl source. Actually, it's a chemoselective reaction because this hydroxyl group forms an intramolecular hydrogen bond with the carbonyl group, which makes it less reactive than the other hydroxyl group. Now it's time to functionalize these free carbon atoms. First, it undergoes deprotection with magnesium bromide to give the bis phenol. Then, this carbon atom is selectively brominated by NBS through an electrophilic aromatic bromination. After that, the two hydroxyl groups are protected using dietered butyl-silyl ditriflate. Now we need to install a hydroxyl group at this position in an enantioselective fashion. So we need a chiral reagent to create a facial bias. Nicolaus group used Davis chiral oxazoridine for this purpose. It has a unique structure. Here you can see the oxazoridine core, a free membered ring containing oxygen, nitrogen, and a carbon atom. The nitrogen atom is attached to a sulfur atom, which actually comes from the classic comfort sulfonic acid, a chiral auxiliary used to induce chirality. You might be surprised to hear that the oxygen atom in the oxazoridine ring acts as an electrophile. After treatment with the base, the resulting enolate attacks the electrophilic oxygen atom opening the ring and forming an unstable hemiaminal, which then collapses to give the sulfonimine. Notice that due to the chiral structure of Davis chiral oxazoridine, the hydroxyl group is positioned below the plane. Next, the newly formed hydroxyl group is protected with TBS. After that, treatment with DDQ as an oxidant and chloroacetic acid provides the oxidant product. 
Notice that this carbon atom is benzylic, so it undergoes hydride abstraction by DDQ to create a carbocationic center, which is stabilized by benzene ring. When it trapped by chloroacetic acid, another point to note is that the newly formed stereocenter has the opposite configuration to the hydroxyl group that was already installed in the molecule. Chloroacetate is not a good protecting group for the rest of the synthesis. So after ester hydrolysis, the resulting alcohol is protected with PMB. In the next step, we're gonna add free carbon units to the aromatic ring and the bromine sets the stage for the palladium catalyzed steel coupling. The resulting allylic alcohol is anoxidized to form the corresponding aldehyde. The next step is asymmetric epoxidation of a double bond. To do this, Nicolaus group used the Jorgensen asymmetric epoxidation to afford the epoxy aldehyde in a diastero selective fashion. The oxidant here is the hydrogen peroxide urea, which is easier to handle than the free hydrogen peroxide. For inducing chirality, pyrrolidine is used, it has a bulky chiral center. First, pyrrolidine attacks the aldehyde to create an imenium ion. After that, hydrogen peroxide attacks a double bond, but it approaches from only one phase of a double bond. Let's go into 3D space to see what's going on. Here's the imenium ion. As you can see, the upper phase of the planar double bond is blocked by the bulky groups. So the nucleophile prefers to attack from below the plane of a double bond. As a result, the epoxide is created below the plane. The next step is bayless hillman reaction. Here we aim to couple this conjugated compound with the aldehyde to introduce the exo double bond. First, Dobko attacks the Michael acceptor via a 1 4 addition. The resulting enolate then attacks the aldehyde. Basically, it's an allo reaction. This intermediate undergoes a proton shift and the negative charge regenerates the Dobko. The newly formed alcohol is then protected with TMS. Notice that this intermediate exists as a mixture of 3 to 1 epimers at this carbon atom. For now, we continue the rest of the synthesis without separating them. In the next sequence, we're gonna create a bicyclic ring. So, boron trifluoride F rate is added. Notice that there are two oxygen atoms that can coordinate to the Lewis acid but it selectively activates the epoxide ring. After that, the carbonyl group attacks the epoxide to create a 6 membered ring. This attack proceeds through an SN2 mechanism, so we get inversion of stereochemistry at this carbon atom. Finally, the negatively charged oxygen attacks the carbon atom to construct a bicyclic core. At this stage, the two epimers are separated, and we continue with the desired stereochemistry at this carbon atom. Now the allylic alcohol is created, by deprotection with TFA. After that, we're gonna introduce the epoxide ring into the system. Nicolaus group tried different approaches for direct epoxidation, but they didn't work. So instead, they installed the epoxide ring in three steps. First, treatment with osmium tetroxide leads to the cis diol. Next, the primary alcohol is selectively tosylated because of its lower strict hindrance. This converges into the good living group. Finally, potassium carbonate deprotonates the secondary alcohol, which then attacks the adjacent carbon atom to furnish the epoxide. After introducing the epoxide ring, the alcohol is oxidized to the ketone by lake refit oxidation. Before continuing, let's focus on its strategy and do some critical thinking. As you notice, this alcohol is finally oxidized. If you remember, before creating the epoxide ring, the desired diastromer was separated. The point is that eventually this hydroxyl is oxidized and the chiral center no longer exists. So, why separate it? In other words, no matter if this hydroxyl group is downward or upward, it's gonna be oxidized. To find the answer, let's go through the evidence. Right before installing the epoxide ring, the hydroxyl group is deprotected and then the allylic double bond is converted to the diol. The orientation of a diol is opposite to the hydroxyl group. So we can deduce that the stereochemistry of the hydroxyl group plays a role in the correct installation of the epoxide ring. And that's the reason for separation of diastromers before epoxidation. Now it's time to get rid of silylene protecting group. So treatment with triethylamine trihydrofluoride leads to the selective cleavage of a ditert butyl silyl group. After that, it undergoes spontaneous formation of the hemiketal by the attack of the alcohol on the carbonyl group. Let's have a look at what we've created until now. Here is an antraquinone core with the correct installation of two protected alcohols. Here is a boat shaped 6 membered ring resulting from the last step. And here is the oxobicyclic core with the alkylating warhead. So far, so good. To accomplish the synthesis, we need to install the two sugar moieties. First, we're gonna start with the bottom sugar. To do this, this chiral ester reacts with an allyl in an allyl reaction. 
As you see, there are only two available functional groups open for business. First, it undergoes ester aminolysis with the vein rep MI. After that, a methyl ketone is formed by adding methyl lithium. Next, the alcohol is protected by acetylation. Treatment with acid results in cleavage of the acetonide and the dimethoxyacetyl protecting groups. Elevated temperature triggers the ring closure in which the primary alcohol attacks the carbon atom to construct the six-membered ring. Notice that we cannot directly install the sugar onto the precursor. The solution is to attach the sugar to this carboxylic acid. It acts as a glycosyl donor. First, we need to activate the carboxylic acid using EDC. In the presence of the base, the acid attacks a central carbon atom of the EDC to create a good living group. Next, the sugar attacks the activated carbonyl group. Notice that the beta onomer of the sugar is the dominant product. Now it's time for installation of the sugar onto the precursor. This reaction is carried out by adding gold as a catalyst. It coordinates to the alkyne and converts it into an electrophile, setting the stage for the attack by the oxygen of the carbonyl group. This proceeds with the help of a non-bonding electron of the oxygen atom in the ring, creating a reactive, positively charged oxygen by kicking off the ester. Now the stage is set for the attack of the hydroxyl group, completing the installation of the sugar. The important point here is that it's converted to an alpha anomer. Nicolaou's group used this approach because the formation of an alpha glycosidic linkage is a daunting challenge due to hysteric hindrance. But why is the alpha isomer the major product? To find the answer, let's focus on the oxacarbanium intermediate. There are two possible directions for the nucleophilic attack. If it approaches from the upper face, it ends up in the axial position and creates the alpha isomer. Attacking from the opposite sides leads to the beta onomer. Since the bulky group occupies the equatorial position, the beta form is generally more stable. That makes sense. But, here's the thing. The beta onomer has to pass through the twist both conformation to place the group in equatorial position. So the reaction follows the more stable and accessible pathway, resulting in alpha onomer. Now let's go through the synthesis of the second sugar. First, the crotonate undergoes standard asymmetric dihydroxylation. Next, the style is protected as an acetonide. The paraffinyl benzyl group helps to get better crystal because it increases the weight of the compound and it's removed next step. After that, just like with the first sugar, we're gonna convert this acid to a methyl ketone using a vein rep amide. It works well without causing overalkylation. Next, the acetonide is cleaved with HCl. Now the stage is set for adding allyl bromide to the carbonyl group using indium powder. This reaction is diastereoselective due to the presence of the hydroxyl group in the alpha position of the carbonyl group. Next, the double bond is converted to an aldehyde by ozonolysis. Finally, the hydroxyl group attacks the aldehyde to construct a sugar moiety. This sugar is protected with TMS and converted into glycosyl donor. After the protection of the precursor, the second sugar is installed using gold catalyst. Tyroxycarcin D is then produced after the protection of two alcohols.